I'm faced with an obstacle I can get over very easily, or I'm faced with this bigger obstacle that's going to take a lot of time, effort, dedication, and setting aside a lot of other things. But at the end of the day, that's going to be the biggest obstacle that I face. And that's going to be the challenge that I want to overcome in the long run. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is the Parker.com podcast powered by WFO.TV. This is a podcast where we interview Parker athletes, Parker coaches, Parker gym owners, and other people deeply involved in the Parker industry in order to bring their insights, their ideas, and their wisdom to you to help make you a better Parker athlete, to help make you a better Parker entrepreneur, and to entertain you with great Parker stories. I'm your host, Adam Dunlap, and today I had the privilege of interviewing Matthew Jang. Matthew Jang has been a tracer since 2008, and he was the man behind the For the Love of the City brand and YouTube channel, which if you were in the parkour world in the early 2010s, you knew that channel was legit. He was sponsored by Trey 4 in 2015, and he's really been a followed and well-known tracer since the mid-2010s. That said, it wasn't until 2021 that he really burst on the scene in a new way. Apparently, in late 2021, he had around 3,000 Instagram followers. At the date of publishing this, he has 333,000 followers. He had three videos especially that are pinned on his profile that went viral. Uh, many people are calling him the Parker Tarzan because virtually all of his videos now feature him wearing no shoes and no shirt. Matthew's also a photographer and he's pursuing his master's degree at Azusa. Please, like and subscribe this, to this video, uh, or like the video, subscribe to the channel, and check out our sponsors in the links below. All of that helps us out tremendously. We publish a new podcast every week, and just about every day we publish a clip from the podcast. So if a two-hour discussion is too much for you, stay tuned for the two or four or six-minute little edits that are power punch sound bites that will bring a lot of value to your life. Without further ado, here's my discussion with Matthew Jane. Matthew, thank you for being yeah, here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's start with a question that I know that a lot of people are asking. When did you stop wearing shoes? When did I stop wearing shoes? Um, I think the real question should be, when did I, I don't know, start filming stuff of me barefoot? But um, yes, that's a better question. It's a much better question. I think, um, so I grew up in Hong Kong, grew up in the city and started doing parkour. Did a lot of training with shoes and without shoes, but of course wanted to, um, you know, do parkour like everyone else. Um, I met a guy from Denmark who kind of um, really inspired me to, to train, um, at least warm up barefoot before sessions, and then put my shoes on. So I've been training barefoot for almost since the beginning, but primarily in shoes from 2008 that's when i started till about i think right around 2011 12 when i moved to hawaii so i think around 2012 is when i started to really train more barefoot where the friends i made were running in the mountains barefoot and you know the coastlines doing a lot of stuff barefoot but whatever i would train parkour put my shoes on did that for a few years on and off of barefoot and shoe training and then during covid um that kind of all changed <laughs> you know we were all jobless we were just figuring life out and in hawaii we were always allowed outside to exercise we weren't ever just you know just stay in your house all the time we were always a lot outside so i was outside barefoot in the mountains um again seaside just all the time and then when i would go to train i would just keep my shoes in my car and go up to a spot and i get and you know like okay it's time to train i'd put my shoes on and i would do that for a little bit and then i realized you know i've, I've done the whole day barefoot i was in the mountains i was surfing i don't need to put my shoes on to to train so i'll just show up to sessions and just leave my shoes in the car and start training and <clears throat> it was quite uh uh maybe invigorating is the word about 
something about uh, they always say you know the best thing about parkour is you only need a pair of shoes you know right so you know i think not yeah i think uh, um yeah i just kind of thought about that i was like you know i don't even need my shoes like i just need my you know my pair of shorts and that we're good so yeah i think that's so you're saying that this is something you were exposed to really early on like really early in your training and then it was moving to hawaii and then being around people that were barefoot more often that then allowed you to kind of make this transition and then COVID seemed like the real catalyst to really catapult you into hey i don't ever need my shoes yeah yeah and th there's another factor in there as well um as i was training during covid i hurt uh one of my one of my feet my big toe on my left foot and uh i was really babying it and then when i finally got to the point where i could um use it more i was like you know i want to strengthen all the muscles up in my feet i don't want to just go straight to putting my shoes on i want to make sure everything in my foot is getting used to uh, being used again on hard concrete. So I was like, you know, I'm going to train barefoot. I hear that's good, good too. I shrunk in the feet. That was another part of it. <clears throat> You're one of the few athletes that trains barefoot. And it reminds me of a, a video. I remember, I think it was Phil Doyle back in, man, it must've been the 2000s. He had some foot where he was barefoot or some video where he was barefoot, or maybe he was in flip-flops or something. That was really the first iteration I saw of someone training barefoot. But to this day, you're the only person I know of that you can consistently find videos with no shoes. And in your case, it seems like every video has no shoes. It seems like the most natural way. What advice do you have for people who maybe are like, you know, I actually want to try that. Do you think it's too aggressive just to do it? Should you ease into it? How would you advise someone ease into it? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, and going back to what you were saying about Phil and stuff, yeah, definitely Phil's a, a big inspiration just seeing his videos. And I know there are a lot of practitioners that do train barefoot like to an extent, um, well, probably not to the extent that I train at this moment. But um, the advice that I give to people as far as um, transitioning to training barefoot or whether they should or should not, um, I always tell them, just it's just like parkour you know you got to start from the basics you know go out for a walk barefoot around your neighborhood and areas that you're familiar with you don't want to be i don't know driving down to, <laughs> to downtown la and making your first walk barefoot with this potentially glass or you know anything that you harm your feet you know go somewhere that you know is safe for your feet that you can slowly transition um walk on grass first, walk on things that are soft and then transition to concrete. And then, you know, you could start off with 10 minutes, a 10 minute walk, you know, mm. extra pleasure and, um, increase it to a 20 minute walk. And then when that feels comfortable, you can go for a 10 minute jog and when that feels comfortable, go for more. And then, you know, just get your feet in contact with as much terrain as you can. Um, one and work thing. your way up, it sounds like. Hmm? And work your way up, it sounds like. like yeah, just yeah, exactly. Progress. Just take it slow and then progress. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that I would do, like, um, I try to only hike uh, hikes barefoot if I know the trail well. And so one thing that I would do, if I'm like trying to scout out a trail, you know, I'll, I'll wear my shoes like to the end of the hike. And then I'm like, okay, you know, I think it's fine to walk back barefoot. So I take my shoes on the long time. There's always, um, I feel like there's always a progression, a, a step that anyone can take to just be barefoot more. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, they see my videos and they assume I'm barefoot all the time, but that's not the case. I am, you know, your, your feet have a limit, at least for me, I'm still, you know, I'm still right now training to get my feet to a point where, you know, I can be completely shoeless, but I do train still in shoes and without shoes. So it's just a matter of what I want to do. And the way I think about shoes now is it's shoes 
are a tool that you can use to help your movement or maybe in some cases they don't help your movement as I'm learning now, but <clears throat> half a session I can be wearing shoes and half a session I could not be wearing shoes. So people that see me uh, jams here and there, you know, shoes or no shoes, it just kind of depends how I feel. Mm. What about the concrete aspect? So I, I, it, I can conceptualize the idea of progressing barefoot and landing on grass and and dirt and things of that nature. But I see you do climbs where it's a concrete wall. Are your feet really rough? Do they have giant calluses? What about it makes it that you able to do that? Yeah, yeah. I get I, again. I get this question asked a lot. My feet are pretty. Um, you know, sometimes people show up to jams and they ask me, you know, can you show me your feet? And I show them my feet, and they're like, oh. They just look like normal feet. I don't. I don't have like, giant calluses on my feet. I don't have the. the I don't think they're rough. They're pretty smooth to touch. Um, I think probably my feet are a little. The skin is a little thicker than the average person, but um, for, I I believe it just comes down to like having good tech. Um, the reason you. <clears throat> people see me climbing a lot of my videos is because it's essentially I don't want to say zero impact, but very minimal impact when you're going up. You know, even when I was wearing shoes, you know, if I want to take a day where I don't want to take so much impact, I just don't jump down. I'm jumping up, I'm climbing. So the same principle is applied to you know, trading barefoot. So if you watch my lines, a lot of it is going up because my your feet will give out sooner if you're jumping down, if you're trying to stick landings. So the, the technique definitely changes. Um, sticking jumps, you can do it barefoot, but it's not the most optimal thing to do. Because when, you, when you're landing, you know, when you're wearing shoes, you want to land the ball of your foot on the edge and kind of roll up, but you, you don't, you can't really do, I mean, I suppose you can if your feet are made of steel, but when you're barefoot, you don't really do that. You, you aim to land on the top. So the technique is different. The technique is different. And yeah, you just have to be very sure of yourself, which is uh, a lot of uh, the reason why I train barefoot. It's just a whole nother uh, method of um, digging deep within yourself and knowing, okay, like, this can be very detrimental to me if I mess up, if I slip up. You need to be really on top of what you feel you can and cannot do so that you don't make mistakes, you don't, you know, cut up your feet or not. Totally. Do you feel that training barefoot has made you better with shoes? So when you put on shoes, do you feel like it's this added boost? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like I tell people it's like, yeah, when I put on shoes, it feels like I have superpowers. <laughs> it's like I it's like wow I don't have to worry about my feet anymore um which is why I like barefoot training because I have to have this it's an increased awareness but when um I'm putting shoes on I'm like oh this I don't have to worry about that I can literally not think about how I'm gonna land well of course you think about it but like a lot less and um I think similarly to like climbing I compare climbing to like bouldering in the gym compared to parkour. Like I love climbing because it's like parkour, but you don't need to worry about how you're going to land because there's mats and stuff everywhere. So similarly, like, okay, when I put my shoes on, all of a sudden there's this whole, you know, this whole uh, part of training that I don't really need to worry about. And it feels, it feels good. Not, yeah. So I have a question for you. It kind of it's about your Instagram, but I want to start the question with more about your history because, and this is a bit embarrassing. So I came across you like a year and a half ago. You had, you had like three videos go viral in late 2021. I'm pretty sure that's when I came across you. So then through watching you, I've grown to really admire your movement. I was like, where'd this guy come from? He's so good. This barefooted Tarzan, like I, I don't know who he is, but he's awesome. And then I was doing research for this podcast and I realized who you were. And it's like you're a different person because the Matthew Jang that I knew of 10 years ago is it was not in my mind as the same Matthew Jang that you are. Mm -hmm. You were sponsored by EF, Battery 4, right? Yeah. 
and you were you were the guy behind the For the Love of the City YouTube channel? Yeah. Okay, this is crazy to me. This is crazy because I just figured this out in researching. The For the Love of the City YouTube channel, it doesn't seem to be active anymore, or at least it's it's not very active. Mm -hmm. But that was the channel. For those of you that don't know, it was one of the channels that, in my opinion, like people looked up to it. I look up to it and I admired the videos that were coming out there. It was really well done. And then, of course, Etre Ford, to be sponsored by them, they're one of the biggest brands. And so to see you with them in 2015, it's like, oh, no, Matthew's been around for 15 years and he's been somebody in the parkour world for, I don't know, I mean, like 10 years or so, maybe even more. Yeah. So this is, this was like, oh, kind of like a mind blowing experience. Then I was like, oh my gosh, now I'm really, really excited to talk to Matthew. Yeah. When did your Instagram blow up though? Because you're at, like 330, 333,000 today, but I don't think you were at that a year and a half ago. Yeah. So a year and a half ago, I was at 3K. You were at 3K a year and a half ago? Yeah. Really? Okay. I scrolled, I scrolled back to your like first posts. So mm -hmm. I wanted to see, you only have 219 posts. I think your first post was in 2000, January 22nd, 2018. Looks like your first post. It had like 5,000 likes though. I think. Mm -hmm. How can yeah. you get 5,000 likes but only have 3,000 followers? Yeah, so when when the several videos that I made uh, really picked up and went viral, like basically the whole, my entire account just like blew up. So that's more or less the reason. When I put it out, it probably had 300 likes. Whoa, so you think when it was blowing up, people were scrolling back and checking things out? Yeah, yeah, exactly. H has this success online opened up avenues for you or has it made you made you reassess your path in life um it's, it's created a, a few opportunities like working with different brands um where i am slowly trying to figure you know that sort of thing out um <clears throat> i'm in la i have a lot of friends out here that do social media either full-time or like um part-time and <clears throat> learning from them and um it's definitely open avenues um not like a huge amount, but I've yeah, just partnered with brands. Um, I'm doing a comp uh, next month and yeah. What happens? Ob obviously like, um, like four different, uh, parkour podcast people have asked me to be on their podcast. Oh, really? Stuff like that. Um, I get sent clothes and shoes. Well, it's funny cause I get sent a bunch of shoes and they kind of just sit in my, uh, my wardrobe back there okay yeah like this would have been great maybe uh five years ago when <laughs> i was really poor and needed shoes but now it's like yeah i've gone the opposite way so after well, this my, my shoes away but this brings up an interesting question and i don't know matthew if there's any way you could be a little bit closer it might help the sound a little bit yeah. but i don't know if that's possible um so this brings up an interesting question. So what makes you incredibly dynamic in my research is that you're you're an athlete. You're awesome at it. You have this really unique brand that's resonating with people and that I'm sure will continue to grow. You're also a photographer and you have a, like 6,000 followers, I think, on your photography Instagram. Yeah. You have a great style, but you're also getting your master's in mental health. Is that correct? At University of California, San Diego. Uh, it's a school called Azusa Pacific, but yeah. Ah, Azusa Pacific. I, I, I said USCD, US, UCSD, and I was like, oh, it must be that. Azusa. Okay, I know Azusa. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So then like, you have all these, all this potential now. It's like, to me, when I see you, I'm like, okay, look, obviously if he gets his master's in mental health, that's a, a, a place where he can serve a lot of people and find a career. His photography is really good. Now he's an athlete and can transition to an influencer. Are, is that what you're, are you trying to weigh that? Or are you like, nah, like this sponsorship stuff, this athlete stuff, it's just a hobby and I want to pursue this career. Yeah. Mental health. Yeah. I think ultimately it's, it's the latter. Um, <clears throat> I've always wanted to be someone that could be of assistance to others, to help others, to, um, help others progress. And I think Parker is only, um, re uh, reinstated those beliefs um parkour being a discipline of self-betterment of improving thyself of growing um 
in unity and togetherness with the community. And I think what I'm studying now is just, just fits into that picture very well. And, um, it's definitely more or less, I'm trying to do it all. I'm trying to do it all. I, um, it's hard to weigh everything, but I know I'm in the right place at the right time. Um, and I want to for sure, like pursue this for the time being and then to see what can come out of it. Um, and with mental health, like I, I just hearing a lot of stories of, of different parkour athletes suffer from poor mental health and, and, Parkour definitely like attracts a lot of people who you know suffer from ADHD, um, who are depressed, who uh, just have these different things, and they they discover parkour and they are quote unquote healed from whatever it is they're they're struggling with, and I think that's amazing and it's a really great and positive thing. But then parkour is is limited to how. Um, you know, the, the capabilities of your body. Yeah. And our bodies aren't going to last so long. We're going to, you know, hopefully we'd be able to do parkour till as long as we can, but like to perform at the level that we want to perform, you know, we have about till age, maybe 35. And then you kind of start to st kind of start going down. Sure. And now um, what was I going with that? Um, yeah. Then, then, so when I see athletes, you know, get injured or drop off, they all of a sudden, they uh that almost that band-aid feels like it's been ripped off like parkour is now mm -hmm. is not a thing that's helping them and they revert to their depressive states their uh, uh you know adhd and all that and it, it comes back harder and worse because parkour as we all know like <laughs> becomes your life and once you can't do it, it's like oh man like now what so um I think uh, there's definitely uh, a lot of mental health concerns, uh, at least for me and what I've seen in the last few years, especially with COVID and whatnot. So yeah, this is something I feel strongly about. This is something that I feel like um, will, will serve the community. Well, um, I'm at the, you know, I've been training park for 15 years at this point, like everything is parkour. Um, in fact, um, I was asked this recently by uh, Rave Kelly. Um, one of the reasons why I am getting my master's now is because it's probably the biggest obstacle that I will face in my life. I'm not particularly academic. I'm not very savvy. I grew up with ADHD, you know, I had a hard time in school growing up and, um, you know, even doing my undergrad was, was I don't want to say a challenge, but like, just kind of got through it and when it came time for me to decide okay am I going to go for my master's I was like you know I could very easily not do it and just pursue you know at the time I was like my Instagram was like blowing up and um oh it was right at that transition time yeah I was like you know I could pursue this but um I don't feel like that's um, that'd be easy. That'd be the easy way out. Be like, okay, of course, do the things I know how to do for the last 15 years and continue doing that and do really well at it. And that's like the easy thing <laughs> to do. Sure. But here I have this obstacle ahead of me, you know, get my master's, which has always been a dream of mine, but I've been tentative to jump on and really pursue that. So, you know, I'm like, okay, parkour, you know, this... I'm faced with an obstacle I can get over very easily, or I'm faced with this bigger obstacle that's going to take a lot of time, effort, dedication, and setting aside a lot of other things. But at the end of the day, that's going to be the biggest obstacle that I face. And that's going to be the challenge that I want to overcome in the long run. And so I, you know, people say, oh, you, you give up parkour to get a master's and do this career. Like, well, I don't see it that way. It's like, this is parkour to me. This is the obstacle that I'm facing. This is the obstacle that I'm learning to overcome. I mean, I'm, I'm in the process of doing that. I'm actually doing like pretty well. So yeah. What are your, what are your thoughts on this analogy? So you mentioned how the easy path would have been 
keep doing the parkour stuff. Don't get your master's. That's this big obstacle. And it sounds like you've integrated the philosophy of parkour into other things besides just movement. So I want to validate that. In addition to that, I want to ask this question about this analogy. So it's like the river flow analogy. People talk about the river's flowing and you flow with the river. And so with that analogy, the easy path isn't necessarily the most difficult path. But the parkour ethos, and this is passed down from Raymond Well. In fact, I could probably read it directly because I have this book, uh, Parkour, with David Bell. Um, let's see if I can find it since... Here it goes. It, it, if two paths are presented to you, take the most difficult one. It's a quote that opens this book, Parkour by David Bell. And I believe that quote's from his father, Raymond. And so that's the parkour ethos. It sounds like that's what you're doing. So with that in mind, what is your thoughts on the idea of flowing with the river? Because maybe the easiest path, some people would say, is the best path because that's what the universe or God has opened up for you. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, to each his own, I think everyone has everyone has to make a decision and determine what it is they want to pursue in life, what challenges they want to overcome. Every path comes with its own set of obstacles and challenges with it. Um, if someone is faced with two paths and decide to go down the one that flows better, the one with less rocks, then like all four of them, you know, I support them. Um, I think it's a matter of like, I think to me, it's just a matter of like putting in your full effort. You know, I think if you are choosing to go down the easier path, like don't let that be an opportunity for you to, um, like half ass the job or whatever it is you're trying to do, like go in with it full heartedly and know that just recognize that this is the path that you've chosen to take. That's maybe a little easier than the other path, but like, I think ultimately we can make things hard or easy for us. You know, like a person can make an easy path more difficult. Um, <laughs> sure. Sure. Like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an analogy. Like, like you maybe you're faced with like a you know a trail. One has like rocks you have to climb over. One's just an easy path. Like you can always make that easy path a little more difficult by maybe taking your shoes off. That automatically makes it much more difficult. Or you know, you put on a backpack that's forty pounds. That is making it a lot more challenging. And you can make this path as challenging as the other one. And at the end of the day, it's your choice or not. But I think it's a matter of the heart behind what it is you're trying to do. And yeah, I think that's that's ultimately what's important. Do you see do you see yourself in the future of being able to integrate your studies and your degree with parkour in some way? Yeah, yeah. Um I I thought about this quite a bit. Um ultimately, yes. I don't I don't really know to what extent or what that looks like exactly. I think before pursuing the degree, um, the program that I'm in, I was debating on <clears throat> going into, into research, into uh, studying athletes and seeing how, um, you know, partaking in, um, not saying parkour is an extreme sport, but like disciplines like parkour is affecting cognition, how it's affecting how our brains are operating, how um, our perception of what is around us changes because it does. You know, they did a study and uh, basically they, you know, they asked some muggles like, "What does from here to there? What does that? You know, how how far do you think it is?" And they're like, "Oh, ten feet." And then they asked like a parkour person or someone who's active in sports and how how far does that look to you? And the people who are active in different disciplines are give you a more accurate answer. So our perception of life, our perception of even time changes depending on what it is we're doing. And so mm -hmm. I'm very curious to see like how parkour um, is influencing the way we think, because at least for me, like, I mean, just an example, I'm constantly looking at things to climb, you know, and sure. you're looking for possibilities. And likewise, like in my career, I'm going to be, you know, working with people counseling and it's the same thing. It's like, instead of looking at a person as like a blank slate, I'm like, oh, you know, this person has a lot of potential. 
to do all these things. And let me think about it that way instead of like, oh, you know, maybe shrugging them off and like, oh, this is a person dealing with depression. This is a person dealing with this, that, you know, they have no hope. But no, I think ever this hope, there's always hope and there's always potential and possibility with everything you pursue in life, which is, I think, ultimately one of the greatest things about parkour, you know? It's teaching potential to everything that we do. You bring up an idea that I've I've never heard before, but it makes a lot of sense to me. So I'll re I'll rephrase in the way I see it and you can tell me if if this is what you're saying. So we've all experienced that where we get into parkour and then some of us for various times see parkour everywhere. All the yeah. possibilities, all the optionality. Like I've stopped seeing that because it became such a part of me that I wonder if it's just in my subconscious running. But I know that in the beginning it was everything I consciously saw and, and thought about things to do. You still do that. You're looking for things to climb and things like that. But it sounds like what you're saying is that you wonder if, and you've been thinking about and even taking some efforts to study the idea that that perceptual difference might ingrain you, might go into you in such a way that it causes you to perceive other things differently as well. Like maybe that kind of rubric for analyzing the world becomes a perceptual rubric that you use for people, you use for helping people, you use for solving other problems in life. This, I've never heard this idea before. It sounds really profound. Is this what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. I think that someone else said this, actually, and I'm just reiterating it, but uh, they gave the analogy of, you know, uh, the, okay, say so there's a park bench. A regular person sees that park bench as something to sit on. A parkour person walks along, they see that park bench, they're like, oh, I can do a hundred things on this bench. A hundred things. That's like... <laughs> that's crazy to me, you know? And that same principle can be applied to people, you know? Instead of this person being, I don't know, one track minded or identified as one thing, like, let's look at them <clears throat> for the potential, <clears throat> for all the potential they could be. And instead of seeing, um, you know, just seeing a person as a hundred opportunities to, um, to do it is whatever they want to pursue. And I think, a lot of just human beings in general, like we, are, we, especially in the states, we live in a system where it's kind of like one one track minded. You 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 need to do this this or fit into this box or this or that or this is your route that you need to take. And I don't see that as being the case. Like I think human beings, like we have so much potential. The only thing is we're limited to our time on Earth. Yeah, so mm -hmm. you know it's it it's more efficient to pick one thing. And I totally get that. But I think if more people took the time to realize their potential, they can really <clears throat> maximize um, their time on this earth. And I think I, I feel strongly about this because, so I grew up in Hong Kong <clears throat> and in Asia, um, a lot of these kids, you know, their parents are like, you're going to grow up, you're going to be a doctor, going to be a lawyer, going to be an accountant, you're going to be someone that can make a ton of money. And that's your track. Like, that's all you can become. And some of them are like, you know, if you don't pursue one of these routes, we're not going to support you. We're not going to um, help you. And if they want to do other things along the way, that's fine. Just as long as like their end goal is this. No? And I mean, like, I found that so tr sad to me, just um, seeing some of my peers like, wow, like you're so gifted in this other thing. Mm -hmm. maybe, it's dance, maybe it's music, maybe it's um, something else that they, they have a lot of potential for, but they never get to, to dive into those things. They never get to even experience what it feels like to <clears throat> pursue that because they're kind of set on this track like from the time that they're born and I, I feel very you know blessed and privileged to have come from a family who did support me you know they're like you know whatever you want to pursue you pursue it and you know we got your back of course they have suggestions but <clears throat> sure yeah why did your parents have a different mindset than maybe some of their neighbors or some of maybe their family maybe their friends why were they different yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
my mom was from Hawaii. <clears throat> my dad um, was um, born born in Asia, and they met in the USA and got married. So I had kind of two two different uh, opinions, views, um, ideas of how I should grow up <laughs> um, being raised by them. And I think uh, my mom being the, the strong, I figured that she is, was more on the, you know, supportive side, you know, you know, pursue your dreams, um, the ideal. And I think over time and I got on board, but <clears throat> I think even now, like I, I'm constantly balancing those two, those, you know, father figure, mother figure. And even me being in grad school is like an example of that because, you know, my dad would love for me to get me, for me to get a PhD. So, but I'm not, I'm just, you know, I'm going to stop at masters and, and see how, how that goes. And if I want to go out further, then I'll do that. Um, but I'm also doing parkour, which is, you know, my mom loves me doing that. So even now it's like, I am <clears throat> doing my best to honor both parents and I'm luck lucky and blessed enough to be able to kind of do it all you know yeah for for sure for sure yeah, yeah what a blessing it does seem like you know, there's something about americans and so is your mother hawaiian then she is not she's not hawaiian okay she's from hawaii. yeah she's from where i'm sorry uh she's eth ethnically chinese but she's born and raised in hawaii oh and interesting there's like, a whole lot story behind that but i was going to make a comment about kind of this american moxie that we have here but it might not apply to you so i'll just skip that comment anyway uh i love it that you had that support from from your parents and that then that you still honor them that's something that that i think maybe a lot of people forget and i've always tried to honor my parents and i think that's a a lot of wisdom there's a lot of wisdom in that approach for sure i mean going i mean i don't know what you're going to say about being in america but it's interesting to be in America because we are living in a place where <clears throat> our parents have started over. I mean, depending on how many generations you've been here, they've kind of like, they've forgotten their past or when they've mm -hmm. come from had like new start, new beginning, which is, which is it. It's great to an, an extent, but there's something that I feel like a lot of us are missing because of that we we don't have strong rooting and because of that um young people are trying to find identity from the thin air <laughs> like <clears throat> and um in hawaii so i'm not i'm not hawaiian by blood but uh, my great grandmother was full hawaiian and she adopted my grandmother so my grandma was raised hawaiian and growing up oh wow learning a lot um from my grandma you know taking care of the land appreciating the ocean and the mountains and really <clears throat> being present uh have all been lessons that uh, i've taken like um very much to heart especially as i'm developing <clears throat> you know this barefoot practice it's like you know <clears throat> the hawaiians believe that so the whole a lot of people think that the Hawaiian people just somehow stumbled upon the Hawaiian islands and they just decided to live there. But no, they came from other parts of Polynesia. But to do that, <clears throat> uh, Polynesian had to, they were in the ocean and they had to, they, were, they studied the ocean so much, the tides, the currents, they see how the tides come off their island. And <clears throat> I think the story goes, you know, they're looking out at sea and they see a current tide wave, I don't know, wave coming off of some distant land thousands of miles away. And they're like, there's land out there and we should go, we should go, you know, explore it. But to do that, <clears throat> as you're voyaging across the sea, you need to one, look ahead of the boat and see the tide or whatever coming off the land ahead of you thousands of miles away and look behind you to know where you've come from or you get lost and so <clears throat> this is the idea of forward thinking but also <clears throat> knowing where you've come from and i think a lot of people in america they don't have they just have the forward thinking they don't have the like 
what lessons have my ancestors passed on to me that I can <clears throat> uphold, honor, and respect and bring with me into the future? It's like we young people, we're just trying to reinvent ourselves from the thin air. When we think we're like amazing at that, but no, like a lot of the things we're learning like have existed for for a long, long time. And it's right. funny, like it, it's it's hilarious to me. Like you see things like the liver king who you know, and that's a whole other thing, but like, you know, do, living life more so like our ancestors and like people think this is, it's a new thing, but it's like, it's, it's a new old thing that we're just realizing has, is really important and crucial to our existence <clears throat> that we've just veered so far off the path from. And I think about that, especially with parkour, parkour is the same thing. It's like parkour, like the human body is meant to do, it's meant to climb, run, swim, defend, lift, um, and jump, you know, those sure. are like, those are our God given abilities. Like that's what we're born to do. But somehow we live in a world where like people only run, we run marathons and that's great. I love that for them. Sure. We're only climbing. And that's great. I love that for them too. People are maybe only jumping, maybe they're doing track and field, but like to to move your body in a way that is encompassing at least the running jumping and climbing <clears throat> we're the only ones doing that um and it's like we've taken hold of something that we were meant to do and doing it in obviously the modern day world and urban environments but i think what at least what i'm learning now is like we weren't necessarily intended to do that like just in urban environments we're intended to do that in natural environments. The human being, we're so unique in that we're the most adaptable creature on the planet. We can adapt to everything. <clears throat> so why are we not trading more barefoot? Why are we not trading more nature <clears throat> and those things? Because if that's where our movement originates from, why would we not want to ground ourselves in those roots? And what I love about parkour is it's all basics. It's like, the things you learn on your first week of training are the same movements you're doing 10 years down the line. You're doing safety belt, con belt, all those things are, you're doing the same thing 10, 10 years down the line. It's just the extent to which you're doing that, the level is different. So we have this idea of like grounding ourselves in our foundations, but somehow like even within parkour, we've missed that, oh, human beings are doing this like on rocks and trees and all this sort of thing. So, you know, after doing parkour, more or less, um, with shoes on for 13 years, like, and now doing it barefoot, I was like, wow, like I, I'm in touch. I feel in one in touch with myself to a whole nother degree, but also in touch with something that is behind us, something that existed before us. And it's almost like humorous to me, like, you know, that I blew up because I, I do stuff barefoot. I'm like, you know, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. You no, know? <laughs> this is, has existed for a while. Um, I'm just, I just have like some experience of parkour and I'm doing it in, in urban and natural environments and that's it. <laughs> There's a lot of beautiful things you just said. I loved the ancestor thing, looking back and looking forward. Cause I think you're totally right. What do we look back? What do we look back to as Americans? You know, I was born here. I'm in Oregon, born and raised here. I look to my grandparents and I, my, I have an uncle and my grandfather have done a lot of genealogy stuff. So I know like, okay, my great, great, great grandfather immigrated from France and these people came from here and whatnot, but there's no grounding. There's no, like, even the culture in America is kind of there's, there's not many real cultural elements. Everything is like, maybe there's a, 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 a Southern cultural element and a Northwestern cultural element or a California cultural element, but what do we ground ourselves in? And I was in Oahu just a couple weeks ago, actually. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was in a different country. I haven't been to Hawaii in 30 years since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel comfortable there because it felt so different. There was like a different energy. There was a different and it was extremely positive, but I noticed that there was something different about the people there. It didn't feel like I was in the United States. It felt like I was somewhere else. 
And maybe you're speaking to some of the reason I felt that is because there's something about the culture that's that's deeper and longer lasting in Hawaii that still exists that yeah. doesn't exist in the United States because we're a 200 year old country and Hawaii is a much, 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 much older culture and a much older people. For sure. Yeah. Like definitely. Like I resonate with that a lot. I think Hawaii is, is definitely a very special and powerful place, um, spiritually in history and in culture. And, um, I think there's a lot that the world can, can learn from Hawaii or just, it, you know, island cultures in general, but yeah, for sure it does. Well, to, to hear that, uh, you've had that experience for yourself. I want to read something that kind of relates to this. It's from an, an Instagram post of yours. I want to read it to you. I want to quote what you said, and then I'd love to have you respond to it or expand on it, yeah. whatever you feel like. You said this, <clears throat> while, while I'm not one to dance the hula, I would like to think of my movement as my spirit dance, my art and my method of physical storytelling. I'm a firm believer that your movement practice expresses your innermost being and can become a method of interaction between the internal and the external. Yeah. I found that really profound and perhaps it speaks to, to your journey. Perhaps it speaks to, to what the things you were just saying. Of course, obviously some of that might relate to being barefoot. Tell me more, expand on that. Yeah. yeah I mean, <sighs> where to begin? Um, <laughs> I could, I could really go into this, but, um, yeah, I think ultimately, <sighs> The hope is that, you know, okay, I believe in, I believe in the, in the soul and the spirit that is within you and, and that, I don't want to call it a thing, but, but your spirit is trying to express itself to its truest form. And we're only given, um, so many things to, to do that with, um, on earth, you know, and I think, uh, you know, and the hope is that, you know, people are able to find ways to express themselves as close to their truest form that they possibly can. For me personally, I think parkour is the closest thing that you can experience, like just maybe like, um, dancing or cop water, basically like the, le the least amount of things that you use to express yourself, I feel like that's coming closer to your soul expressing itself. And that's why, that's another reason why I think doing parkour just in general is amazing because you, it's just your body and your shoes for most practitioners. And then me taking my shoes off is stepping into myself even more because I'm not limited to that external apparatus <laughs> yeah, for Google or something and it's like you know um it's interesting that some of the greatest forms of expression nowadays are mainstream sports and it's it's it it's interesting because it's like the potential of the human body is only expressed to a certain degree and it is reliant on external things like i don't want to like bash on other sports i'm okay i'm just gonna bash on football <laughs> um, um uh you know football player big dude pro probably a big dude um has a ball has to play in a field you know and they're running they're throwing the ball they're like taking hits and that's really it but you take the ball away you take the court away like what do you have this is a big dude then but what can you do maybe run. Um, and so your identity is, is placed within the, the ball, within mm -hmm. the, the field, I feel like more so than the person. So if I look at a football player, it's like, well, yeah, they're their person, but they're actually, they're more a ball and a field because without those two things, what can they do? <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> So I'm very like intrigued by movement disciplines where you're only using your body, like just dance, capoeira, course parkour, um, 
Yeah, because the expression, you're expressing yourself in a, in a purer form without the need for, you know, abstract, external things. And I've had this conversation with different people. They're like, oh, well, what is a parkour athlete without walls in their urban environment? And you're like, oh, yeah, you're right. I guess we'd just be like a runner um, or like a climber. But, you know, there's trees and there's rocks and there's fields and there's ocean. There's, you know, rivers you got to traverse and mountains you have to climb. It's like yeah. humans do exist in this context. The context is earth. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. okay, yeah. If there wasn't an earth, then parkour doesn't exist. Fine. But that's less contrived than like, let's make this elongated football, this elongated ball with this texture and these these strings on it that help you hold it. And then let's put on all these pads and let's draw these lines on the ground. The earth is yeah. much less contrived. It's yeah. it's part of who we are. So yeah. I can totally see your argument. Totally. Yeah. And 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 I totally get why, you know, mainstream sports are so popular. It's because the mind can comprehend what's going on because there's so many rules and like uh, limitations to what you can do. It's like, it kind of is what it is, you know, like, oh, the guy crossed the line. Oh, it's not, he's not within bounds. So like whatever it is he did is like, is, is inferior to the game or it's not helping the game. And then people look at parkour. It's like, it's so hard to understand what we're doing. <laughs> so I can see why, you know, why parkour is such a niche, um, discipline because the air with this, there's no, there's no bounds. There's no limits to what we can do. And people have a hard time understanding that, which is interesting because like, we're all, I believe we're all meant to do parkour in some shape or form, you know, but yeah, I, I love the ideas. You know, I've been thinking about this for a, a couple of years. And what I realized was that the rules that a sport gives allow things to be created. So you'd think it'd be limiting, but in some ways it's empowering. So for example, and then I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to give an example that I'll undermine it in a second, but yeah. kind of the, to steel man, the sport argument, because you have a football field and because it's a hundred yards long and because there's four quarters that are 15 minutes and because you only have four downs, it then forces creativity to happen within these bounds and then amazing things happen. So you get a Tom Brady with a winning drive or whatever it may be. But when I was... When I was uh, first in Nepal, where I thought about athletics from your perspective as well. Yeah. And my theory was that how good of an athlete are you if you're dependent on these other elements? Like you've just said, if you're dependent on the pads and the lines on the ground and a ball. For me, I grew up playing basketball. So I was like, all right, the goal is to get this ball and put it through a metal hoop rim. Like, is, what does that really mean? You know, and, and, and it allows for the expression of athleticism but are those people as athletic as people who don't need that? So I thought about it and I said like, what are the pure sports? What are the sports that you don't need anything? And it was like, all right, running, swimming, wrestling, parkour. That's what I came up with. Maybe climbing as well. It's like the things where it's just you and there's something different. There's a, there's a different quality to those sports because they don't have the same limits. And my argument was that the best athletes of all time aren't Michael Jordan, Babe Ruth, Wayne Gretzky, although Michael Jordan was my idol growing up. My argument was the greatest athletes ever were Bruce Lee, Raymond Bell, David Bell, and then, I don't know, Steve Prefontaine or someone like that. You know, that was kind of my vision. And and so there's there's two arguments, but I totally, totally, totally vibe with your idea. And I think you're, the way you're expressing it is pretty profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what do I know? I'm just one human being. Right. Well, you're, you're just... <laughs> we're just all human beings trying to figure it out yeah exactly would you at all be interested in talking about uh your faith at all you have a joshua 1 9 is quoted in your instagram mm -hmm. and uh, would you care at all to talk about that and maybe to add to that you said in a post that from 2016 to 2019 you were doing christian nonprofit work involving mm -hmm. parkour in europe so maybe there's a good parkour tie in there as well. Can you tell us about your faith, what it means to you and anything relating to that and, and maybe parkour as well? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, where to begin? Uh, where to begin? I think everyone is, I'm just going to think a lot. I think everyone is on a, on a journey to discovering, um, themselves and 
trying to better yourselves. But then you, you get to a point where you're like, you can only achieve so much within this lifetime. And so and I, even with parkour, it's like, oh, you know, I'm trying to become the best version of myself that I can be. But truly at the end of the day, you will never actually be able to do that because you will die. <laughs> so then it, it begs you to ask the question, oh, what if there was a possibility of continuing <clears throat> <clears throat> that self-development path of death? And then you start thinking about, okay, maybe there's an eternity. If there's an eternity, maybe there is uh, an entity that created uh, eternity, that created the universe. Maybe that entity is God. Maybe that entity is something else. And it just depends on what you believe. But for me, <clears throat> I asking myself those questions and which led me to um, go on a journey of, of uh trying to understand religion, trying to understand philosophy, and, and <clears throat> my, from what I've learned, and of course I'm one human being and I, I don't know basically anything <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, but sure. philosophy is like, you know, it's a study of, of an existence and the meaning of life. And I, you know, I took a class and it was like, Oh, there's like one way of thinking and it leads to this. But then you get to a point where like, oh, that was kind of all pointing you back to the beginning. And then, you, like, oh, you go down this route. Oh, that makes sense. Maybe that's the meaning of life. And then it kind of like circles around and then it brings you back to the beginning. And you're like, oh, so I could spend the rest of my life like just going in this circle. And of course, I'm not a philosophy major. I'm sure there are philosophers out there that have a more... Um, and I have a greater understanding of this and I would love to talk to someone like that, but that was my understanding. It's like, okay, maybe it's not philosophy. Maybe it's, maybe it's like religion. And, uh, I grew up in a Christian household. So that was like the, the basis of my beliefs, uh, for, uh, quite a time. And then, you know, you, you grow up and you mature and you come to a place where you're trying to figure out if that's what you want to continue to believe in. And <clears throat> Um, through like school projects or, or classes that I've taken, like I basically went on my own little spiritual journey of, um, you know, trying to learn as much as I can about the big five, you know, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism. <clears throat> and, um, so <clears throat> I went to, uh, a, a mosque, a Muslim mosque, and I talked to Imam. They're the ones, the prayer warriors that are calling people into prayer. They know a lot. You know, was able to go in there and talk to him about um, their beliefs. And I went to a synagogue and talked to a Jewish rabbi, learning more about that. <clears throat> I grew up in Asia, so I knew a lot about Buddhism on my own. Um, went to a, a Hindu temple and uh, talked to a guru. He was in the, at, uh, was in the attic and, uh, <laughs> you know, bald and you know, telling me, you know what he believes I, okay okay and then of course i know things uh about christianity and took a class in <clears throat> in college about religion and was learning all these things and um at the end of, at the end of that i was like okay you know a lot of these <clears throat> religions are, are very abstract and kind of wild um but what um did Christianity apart from these other religions is that <clears throat> there um, through Jesus creates a way for us to access eternity while we're on earth and we have the assurance of eternity now whereas other religions you kind of live without knowing what life will be like after death um till you die <laughs> so like Hindus believe in karma. It's like, you know, if it's a cycle of birth and rebirth, death and, uh, death and rebirth. And the idea is that if you build up enough good karma, it covers your bad karma. And so that when you die, you get to be rebirthed into a, a better state. And if you don't do that, you maybe drop a tear. <clears throat> and the goal is to like have covered all the bad things you've done so that you can break that cycle and become one with um, the universe, the cosmos, uh, nirvana, 
it's the same with Buddhism. And basically, like, <clears throat> there's, there's just a degree of not knowing what's going to happen after death. Christian belief, they believe that, you know, there's God and human beings are trying to access the eternal, but we don't have a way to do that. And so he created Jesus to come to us, to make it understandable to us, to give us a way to understand and left the Holy Spirit with us after the death of Jesus going out. So gave us a way to interact essentially with heaven and with God while we're on earth. Meaning we don't need to wait till we're dead to um, find out what's going to happen. It's like we have the assurance. And so knowing that it's like, oh, I have the peace in my heart that, you know, I'm just going to try to be the best person that I can be while on this earth and do parkour and do things. And I have the rest and I'll get so far, you know, and then I have the rest of eternity to continue to self-improve, to become better. Because like I said, going back to <clears throat> my initial statement was, um, we only have a lifetime, at least on this earth, to become the best versions of ourselves that we can be. And we will never achieve that if we're limited to our time on earth. But if you believe that there's something more, then you can get to experience fully becoming like the truest form of yourself. What was the nonprofit work you did? The Christian nonprofit work in <laughs> Europe 20, from 2016 to 2019? Yeah. So that was, um, with, uh, so it, it depended on which year, but, um, Maybe some parkour people know of Inspired Tour. They know mm -hmm. Daniel Ilabaka. They know of uh, some of the work that he's done. Um, just different tours ar around Europe. Um, this parkour tour is just like the hope is just to to spread loving and positive positive vibes like around. And um, you know, if people ask questions about what it is that we believe, we get to share and. That's basically it. So started with uh, Inspire Tour, um, twenty fifteen. Uh, we did with tour in the U.S. and then twenty sixteen in Europe, and then that branched off to um, working with uh, those tours that not been officially partnered with um, an organization called YWAM. YWAM is short for Youth with the Mission. Mm -hmm. And their goal is to equip uh, young people to go into the world and, and serve, you know, different communities in whatever ways they need, you know, whether it be food, shelter, uh, <clears throat> services, books. And so the Inspire Tours were, I can't speak for the, the lifetime of Inspire Tour, but at least from the time I was involved with it, it had kind of been like partnered with YWAM. We would stay at different uh, houses, facilities that they owned. And <clears throat> um, we eventually were able to yeah. strengthen that relationship and then um, work to create something that was a little more long term because these tours are about unlocked law. So, sure. yeah, create a, a longer term thing. So on these tours, you would like travel to a city and then you would, you would perform or you would, you would host jams. Like wh what was the, what was the parkour tie into that? Yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. We would, uh, just a group of guys go out and host jams, just be like, oh, we're going to be in your city for three days. Let's go train. Um, see a bunch of nature stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, the goal is really just to go into into different communities and, and impact the community in a positive regard and, and see people come together. Mm. Yeah. I I didn't know, because I knew the Inspired Tour, and I knew Daniel Abaka was involved. I didn't know that that was the purpose of the tour. I have no recollection of that. That's really cool. Was Vinny, well, was Vinny a part of the U.S. tour? Um... In in indirectly, um, I think 
I wasn't on that tour, but I believe on one of the tours they stopped in in Colorado and he hosted them and um Vinny and, and the rest of the guys like share very uh similar values and outlooks and so yeah. um whether that <clears throat> becomes a thing in the future again, we have it to see, but yeah. But that'd be um, awesome. It'd be awesome to see another tour like that. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 uh it's been a, it's been a wild journey. Let's let's just say that yeah. uh, parkour being a young sport and all, and seeing how how things pan out. Yeah, Gimme. You were gonna say something else before I cut you off with with my Vinny question. Was there something else you were gonna say about the tour in Europe or something? Um, no, 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 thanks, no. Um, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here. How are you feeling, by the way? Oh, you know, is, is this going good? Do you want to start to wrap it up? How are you feeling? Doing great. Pretty good. All right, I got some more questions. This this would be one that might take us on a rabbit trail. Here we go. This is from a story post that you have. It's one of your highlighted stories on your profile. So people, if you're watching this, you can go check it out. Someone asked you, how do you split parkour and Cali training with enough <laughs> regeneration <clears throat> yeah and and actually what i'm not actually interested in the first half of your answer although if you are we could talk about it but what stood out to me was you said diet is a huge contributing factor but that's a discussion for another time and i think you said earlier in that also response that diet maybe wasn't something that the poker community was talking about very much yeah so i wonder if you could share your thoughts on diet your experience you're not just a you don't just do parkour you do other types of training as well yeah and so and it sounds like you're very intentional and so yeah. what thoughts do you yeah. have yeah it's funny because i think if someone were to ask me what things did i do to improve my parkour skills in the last <clears throat> three to four years i would tell them not doing parkour <laughs> really not not doing parkour helped my parkour and um and I get, I think in that, that led to, you know, focusing on diet and stuff as well. But, um, let's see, how can I begin this discussion? Um, let's see, L let's see, uh, lifting. I started lifting during a time when I was suffering from jumpers knee. So I had to take a little break from taking high impacts. So I was like, okay, I don't feel like I have a very strong upper body. Let me work on that. So mm -hmm. the lifting, the explosive power that I gained in my upper body then allowed me to climb better, to fall better, to prevent myself from getting injured when I eventually did start doing parkour. So that's how lifting helped me. <clears throat> um, trail running, I would <clears throat> trail run cliffs, uh, you know, ridges on Oahu and that helped me with my speed. You know, you when you trail run, you constantly are have to be extremely aware of the ground and what you're running on, obviously, and so you don't mess up and, and fall off the side of a cliff. And so <clears throat> that helped me be a lot faster in parkour, just being able to make decisions um, midline <clears throat> um, helped me from, from, you know, eating crap, bailing, and that's how trail running helped me. Uh, surfing, surfing, just I could, you know, I have, I have, can have a whole discussion about surfing, but <clears throat> surfing, a lot of surfing, I feel like is almost the opposite to parkour because parkour, you have full control of what's happening, you have control of every single thing. And in a sense, you're like, you're the master of the arena. You're kind of like God in your little like arena of like urban obstacles. And everything you do is like, it's up to you. Where surfing, a lot of that is giving up yourself to the wave, to nature. And you're basically like, you're, you're doing, you're only allowed to do what the wave is allowing you to do. And so mm -hmm. it's a sense of surrendering yourself and mm -hmm. yeah, just surrendering yourself to what is happening and going with the flow. And so I believe that 
that helped my parkour and allowing myself to feel flow, to feel the the environment around me challenging and pushing me to do something. I think a lot of people go into um, training like, oh, I have this thing in mind that I want to do and I just need to do that. <clears throat> I think now, like, of course, that's the half of it. But another half is like, okay, let me look at this environment and try to listen. Maybe not listen, but look and see what the environment wants me to do with it. Instead of me going in with the headspace of like, this is my land to conquer and let me conquer it with my movement. It's like, let me go into this land and let it tell me, oh, this is what's already here. How can I put my body into a position that is... Um, a reflection of what already exists. And so that's how surfing helped me. And then <clears throat> um, how diet comes in, it's like, well, um, you know, obviously our body it runs off of fuel and how well we feed it is, is greatly going to determine how we perform. And, <clears throat> you know, from the time I started doing parkour, even until now, like, Especially in the beginning, it's like parkour. I just look around and like the parkour guys are like kind of depicted as scrawny guys with above average strength legs. <laughs> <laughs> and like, yeah, even now, I mean, I think now lots more, a lot of athletes are lifting and they're, they're, you know, honing in on their diets better. But looking back, I'm like, yeah, we're a bunch of scrawny guys with above average strength legs and definitely undernourished. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think a lot of OGs can, can, um, um, what's the word, uh, relate to what I'm not say, but like, I remember training from 11 in the morning to 11 at night and, eating one meal and it would be like McDonald's because we were all poor and broke and we couldn't afford anything else and we had no sense of what was good for us anyways so you know it was great we got something cheap we we're full but definitely not eating enough and that's why mm -hmm. we were so you know scrawny and <clears throat> um and uh yeah we definitely we definitely weren't feeling feeling ourselves um, as we should. And I think the, the, the biggest turn in the community was when Tim Sheaf went vegan. That's when all the athletes started to become more food and, uh, nourishment conscious. Okay. All of a sudden it was a high level athlete realizing that, oh, burgers and fries is not <clears throat> the most optimal diet. Um, maybe we need to look at a more plant-based diet. Maybe we need to think about what we're putting into our body instead of just training 12 hours a day and eating the cheapest meal. <laughs> I mean, I was in London for a time and even training with them, like in, this was pretty recent, like 2018, it was like, we would just train and then go to um, the shop and get a, 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 what was it called? Like a three pound meal deal. It's three pounds, you get sandwich, drink, and like, back chips that's what we ate and it was like you know some of the stuff is good but like for if you look at other sports and the amount of activity like basically i i put parkour like right next to i want to say uh like any other elite sport like crossfit um and you can see what they're eating and if anything we're doing more than they are we're doing elite athlete level activity without the diet and the training. And so I got to a point where like, what if we fed ourselves like these athletes? Mm -hmm. um, I love the video. I think Storm made it. Yeah, they made a video during the Olympics. Basically, I think that the whole premise was like, mm -hmm. don't forget parkour athletes who are doing Olympic level movement activity without the safety of the track without the formal training without the diet and you know it has you know guys doing massive long jump triple jump all these things and i love that video because it's like wow yeah like if you train parkour at a high level we're like 
and you're re- truly dedicated. Like we're training, like basically, at any competitive level, in the sure. But sure. we lack diet, nutrition, and at the time, strength training. And so, I love the direction that the community is going into now, where like diet is more focused, weight training is more of a focus because we are again stepping into the, our fullest potential. And, um, <clears throat> so when I get a comment asking me, um, about, you know, how, how I bounce different things and I realized that that was something that I was really lacking and yeah, you can do, you can do all these activities at once, but without the proper nutrition, you will burn out. And that's what happened to me. <laughs> I learned that during COVID, like no job so i was just surfing climbing parkour calisthenics all the time but and i realized my body was burning out mm. and i was thinking like, why is my body burning out like i'm fit i'm active i'm doing a lot of things and i realized the two things that were missing were the diet and strength training because all the gyms were closed so i can do all the activities Like I do a lot and people ask me, how are you able to do so much? And my belief is that strength training in the gym has been the reason I'm able to do everything. Cause it's like, it's strengthening every part of my body so that when I go out and I, and I'm choosing to climb after not having climbed for a while or choosing to do parkour after not having to do parkour for a while, my body is still in a state where it's strong enough to do that. And to do that, you need to have the right diet. Mm. And so. COVID made me realize, oh, okay, like I'm getting injured because I have lost my um, base level of strength that I would normally have when I'm lifting. And so instead of my muscles taking um, the impacts, uh, the, the forces that I'm putting on it, it's my joints. And I was really feeling in my joints. It's like, okay, yeah, like. Uh, strength training and good diet really important are important supplements to the to parkour yes and and of course it all depends like to what level you want to do it if you don't care about getting better if you don't want to do like a ton of things then it's different for every person you know um i know i think I believe like Phil Doyle, he doesn't lift, but yet he has like the biggest jumps. Right. Like parkour athlete. So it's kind of to each his own. And I think if I was just doing parkour, then maybe I wouldn't need to lift. But because I want to do so many other things, like having a base level of strength that I can gain in the gym has been very, very, very important to me. And in fact, in the last at least five years, like, lifting has been my primary discipline that people don't see people don't see like they assume that it's just from doing parkour or it's just from climbing i'm like no actually i'm doing a lot of strength training behind the scenes that no one sees uh and calisthenics training that no one sees and diet that no one sees and so you are seeing like all of these different things coming into one and tell people like, you know, if you want to, you want to do what I do, you really need to consider a lot of different things. Don't just jump into it, yeah. especially if you're going to start climbing, like parkour climbing, especially like it requires a baseline of strength. It's really cool to see this transition because these ideas like diet or alternate training regiments to supplement one's parkour training are relatively new ideas and they've been seeded throughout time but i remember when i lived in france i worked with david i asked him like what do you think about lifting weights because my theory was you don't need weights and he said well if you think weights will help you lift weights but he wasn't like championing in weights and even at that time 10 years ago it really wasn't much of an idea and then i think it was Oh man, I don't know how to, pr- and this is so embarrassing. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Calum, Calum from store, Cullum. I don't even know. Callum, Callum, whatever. Um, Callum, Cullum. 
Callum was the first guy I saw really lifting. Oh, there was somebody else. Oh, crud. I forget his name. Anyway, there was a, there was like a couple people. Callum was one of them who was like really getting into the weights. And so that was interesting to see him do it. And his jumps progressed at a really high level. Yeah. And we're starting to see that come in. I watched a video recently of Dom where he talked about his ankle that he injured. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how it had always healed. So he kind of neglected it. And then it kind of just never healed. And then he realized he really needed to focus on, on healing it. And yeah. there's like, there's things like that that are, I think we're starting to realize as a community is like, yeah, parkour is great. You know, that's our goal. That's what we do. But how else do you supplement your training or your recovery or your physicality or your athleticism? Maybe you foam roll. Maybe you focus on your diet. Maybe you also lift weights. Maybe you also work on flexibility. And these other things can be incorporated. And if you don't do it, then maybe it'll work for you to each their own. But if you do do it, maybe it'll prevent you from being injured or maybe it'll increase your abilities or maybe it will lead to new paths, whatever it may be. So it's really cool to see that coming yeah. into the parkour community in different facets. Yeah. Do you, do you have a diet? I mean, what would you, do you have anything specific you would recommend or anything you've experienced? Yeah. 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 Before I jump to that, I want to say that yeah. uh, at least for the lifting, like I think <clears throat> when I got into lifting, I, one of the first things I realized was, okay, yeah, it does make your jump better, but more than that, it makes your landings feel 10 times better. And so it's become more of a preventative strategy for me. Like, I don't think you need to lift, but like, will it allow you to do parkour for longer because it's taking the strain off your joints and ligaments? Totally, totally. Like, so like my reckon, like what I tell people is like, if anything, just lift for the injury prevention um, mm -hmm. benefits you get from it. Just lift so you can land and not feel pain. Like. It's great that you can jump so far, but you know, if you're only, if you have to rest a few weeks or like, you know, you get injured and then you're able to jump that far again, it's like, well, you're not going to be able to do that for a long time. You're going to be able to, you need to like focus on a way to, you need to strategize and come up with a training plan that's going to allow you to reach your goals. And if your goal is to do parkour for as long as you can, then I think strength training is incredibly uh, useful and beneficial. Um, if you only plan to, I don't know why anyone would only want to do parkour for maybe five years and just be like, oh, okay, I did it. Although I do know some people who have done that, you know, they're happy. So good for that. But if your goal is long term, then lift some weight. Sure. <laughs> sure. You know, it, it's such, a, I get, it annoys me, but in like a humorous way. So on parkour.com, we often post videos of people doing big jumps. And we have a lot of followers that are not parkour people. They're just fans of parkour. And the comment that I know someone will make when we post a big jump is something like, um, his knees are yelling at him. Like he'll replace his knees in 10 years, blah, blah, blah. It's always knee stuff. It's always knee stuff. And what people don't realize is the knees, like, what are the knees? The knees are joint, right? With ligaments and tendons and bones and there's muscle. The the connective tissue shouldn't be absorbing the impact from your landing. It should be your muscles, right? And of course, maybe there's some bone in terms of, but at the end of the day, it's like, if you're landing really well, it's the muscles that are absorbing all of it. And it's so funny that, that people still think that like, I don't know, the connective tissue would be taking it. No dope, a bad landing, it's going to be the connective tissue. That's how people get hurt, but it, it's the muscles. And so if you train those muscles, right, then that's preventative. And so yeah. seems pretty, pretty obvious. Yeah. But anyways, what about the diet? You, you said you had some diet stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, honestly, I think the most important thing is just to eat enough calories because <clears throat> I don't think in, I don't, well, I think just people in general don't have an idea of how important that actually is. So like, I think every parkour athlete should go right now. If you're listening to this. Go right now, type up calorie intake calculator and what it just asks you, it asks your name, that's an asking your name, your age, your height, the amount of activity that you do. And it gives you an approximate calculation of how much calories you need to intake. Mm. And it sounds super simple, but ask any Parker athlete, do you know how many calories you need to be eating? They don't know. So like, well, 
obviously you're you're outputting so much and that's coming from somewhere so would it it not be very important to you to know how much you need to fuel your body sure in order to sustain being able to do that amount of activity over a long period of time you know it's like you put in energy to output energy so if you're not putting in enough your body is taking it from something and then you just end up like it just ends up being com- becoming a detriment to yourself. Because then I feel like most power bar athletes, like they're because they're so low fat percentage, their bodies are probably constantly eating at their muscle. So if you were just able to feed your body enough, you would actually just be on a steady um, plane of progressing instead of like you're getting stronger. But then you're not feeding yourself enough, so it's like your body's kind of eating itself, and you're not able to like get any stronger or better just like, because of that. You're and trying to grow your muscles, but you're running a calorie deficit. Yeah, and then they're like, "Oh, I just, I just need to jump more to get a bigger jump," which, of course, yeah, that that's going to be helpful to an extent. But if you're not fueling your body to build, rebuild that muscle bigger and stronger, then you're just going to be in this cyclical cycle of like going up and down, up and down. But if you're eating enough, you will be on an upward trend of sure. getting better. So that's number one, eat enough. Eat it's enough. It's really simple. Like I'm not even at the part where like choosing what you need to eat. I think so many people are so focused on like vegan diet, paleo, this and that, but like, okay, yeah, you ate a tons of vitamins and minerals, but you're still... 500 calories below what you need to eat. And, you know, one of my friends, he's a competitive powerlifter, and he's like, you know, it's it's great to be able to eat a lot, a lot of these healthy foods, but at the end of the day, calories are calories. And sometimes if it takes you eating a McDonald's burger just to get those calories, sometimes that's what it takes. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to have a hard time like listening to that. Like, oh, are you saying I should eat burgers? No, that's not the case. You should be fueling yourself with good food. But the important part is to just hit your maintenance calories to do, to, do, um, to perform better. So if you're able to intake enough ca- to reach your maintenance calories, then you have the option to pick and choose what you're feeling your body. Like it... I mean, in the ideal world, you'd be able to do both, but like, sure, both grossly in the ideal world. Hit maintenance calorie. That's the most important thing. Just hit maintenance calories. <laughs> Second thing, you start choosing healthier foods. You know, um, of course, like <clears throat> more, more um, vegetables, more fruits, more nuts. You can eat those. Um, uh, I think for for what we do. No, I'm not even going to say that. I've been told, at least for me, by my chiropractor, who's also a nutritionist, that for what I do, it is good to be on a <clears throat> high fat, high protein, and fewer carb diet. Because, and especially for me, I don't enjoy eating per se because I, I just think it's a waste of time. But <laughs> so this is why I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about this because I have to be very thoughtful about this because I don't enjoy eating. So I want to make sure what I eat is influencing me in the best way. And so a high fat, high, um, protein diet, basically, um, I always forget the numbers, but it's something like one, one, one gram of, uh, of a carb is like six calories a one gram of protein. Yeah. I think it's four. I think it's four for protein. I want to say it's four for carbs and nine for fats or something. One yeah. Like yeah. One gram so basically fat. fat is double the amount of calories. So yeah. Yeah. You can eat less and be able to essentially do more. So if you look at it from a like efficiency standpoint, like, oh, it makes more sense to be able to eat less and do more. Right. So 
a high fat, high protein diet, I feel like for parkour athletes would be very beneficial because mm. we don't have all the time in the world to, um, to be eating because we want to just train and then just like sit down, eat for 10 minutes and then train again. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. If you can get on a high, the thing is it's, it's a little more expensive because obviously carbs are the, the cheapest source of calories. Sure. If you get on a high carb, I mean, <clears throat> high protein, high fat diet. then I think that's very, as far as I know, would be very good for most proper athletes. Um, but of course with that, like, you're, you're training, you're training your body to burn fat as its primary source of energy rather than carbs. The reason why so many people eat carbs is, is it's the, it's your body transfers carbs into energy a lot more efficient and quicker than, than fats. But if you can train your body to convert fats to energy, then it can become more efficient. And I'm sure there are a lot of people listening and maybe saying a lot of things that are wrong, but this is my understanding. <laughs> yeah. You know, who knows? And the the diet wisdom changes all the time. So one day it's this and one day it's that. I will say that I went on a couple of years ago an all meat diet mm -hmm. for various reasons. And the coolest thing about it was my energy was stable all day. I had become accustomed to more or less crashing after lunch. And then all of a sudden I was like, dude, I had the same amount of energy from the moment I wake up until the moment I fall asleep. It was amazing when I got rid of the carbs. So I pretty much try to avoid wheat-based carbs i'll still eat fruit in the summertime when it's like the summer fruits or berries and things like that but but anyway everyone's got to do their own thing you got to find what works for you but yeah definitely you're running a calorie deficit you're in trouble yeah there's a newer thing that a lot of uh, bodybuilders are are um doing now it's called carb cycling and basically it's huh. you time the intake of your carbs um for before and after training when your body is going to need it the most and if you time it right, then your body is actually very efficient with the carbs and you don't crash. So <clears throat> I've been experimenting um, with this in my own training, mostly for lifting, but before lifting, I'll just eat like a bowl of rice and I'm, I go to training immediately. And so my body is using those carbs and obviously I'm training so I don't give my body the opportunity to crash or be tired. And then immediately after I, I have a high protein high fat um, intake of food. <clears throat> and so because carbs are the most efficient to absorb, it just kind of makes sense to like have that right before training. And he, even in the like lifting uh, communities, you see, depending on how far you dive in, you see a lot of um, <clears throat> lifters there snacking on Rice Krispies right before lifting and uh, gummy worms while they're lifting too. Like, basically and basically maintain that like immediate um intake of energy of carbs throughout their lifting session so i feel like there's definitely a lot to learn um from that and we can take information from other disciplines um <clears throat> as far as diet and intake absolutely tell me this what are your goals i kind of would like to to kind of uh, move the conversation to the end by talking about you and your future. And so I'm curious to know, what are your goals for this year? You got February 1st, so we got 11 months left. And then also the, your longer term goals. So I'd like to know where you see yourself in five years, or where you see yourself in 10 years. Yeah. Goals, yeah. <clears throat> um, start with the most immediate. Uh, get my degree. I'm about a year in. I have a... Uh, a year and a half more. So this get yeah, my degree and start working and, and of course also training on the side. Um, train as much as I can. Uh, my goals are very free flowing, but <laughs> train as much as I can. Um, goals for parkour training right now is just to kind of see the limit to which I can train barefoot. Uh, starting to do more exercises to strengthen my feet, to um, take impacts. Um, yeah, just, just see how far I can take it. Um, 
see more people train barefoot. I think that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> I have no real specific goals for parkour. It's just really to have fun. I think having trained for 15 years and um, doing all the things I wanted to do, <clears throat> things like, you know, hitting IMAX, running pre, manpower gap, doing things like that. Like I have all like the, basically all the big things I wanted to achieve in parkour are already behind me. And so <clears throat> I'm in a season of just enjoying myself, um, enjoying the relationships um, in the community, um, not really just having fun and growing as a person through that process. Um, you don't have any, like when you go out to train, are there jumps that you're like, oh, I want to stick that jump or I want to get better at this jump? Are there even micro goals, things in the back of your mind? Or do you show up and you move and train and enjoy and go from there? Yeah. More so the latter. I don't really, and then this has been majority of my training actually. And I think that has been, at least for me, helpful to my journey. Everyone trains differently, but like, <clears throat> I've never, I don't want to say never, but like, I've never really had the objective of like, I want to make this thing happen. Let me train for this thing specifically. It's more so like, these are some things that would be nice to it, but I'm not gonna <clears throat> hold myself to that um and i think that's allowed me to um be i want to say forgiving i see a lot of athletes who are like they go in with this goal of achieving this certain thing and then when they can't do it they beat themselves up about it <clears throat> and i've definitely have done that too but like maybe not to that extent and i'm like wow i mean shouldn't you just be doing this because it's fun and <laughs> it mm. brings you joy and if you if you center your training around the accomplishment so much like you lose the the joy of the journey the joy of getting there and <clears throat> for me like yeah now i have like some goals like <clears throat> currently i love just um I've been obsessed with like finding ways to <clears throat> essentially use a tree in a line. Like mm -hmm. I love a line where like you start in an urban place, you use a tree to get somewhere and you end up back in an urban place or vice versa. Or like <clears throat> anything that is bridging an urban landscape environment with something that's natural. Because <clears throat> of all the things I mentioned, it's like, you know, parkour we're meant to be doing a variety of things and like using urban environments with something that's natural as I, I feel like is a very good representation of that happening. <clears throat> and you don't see that very often. No. You don't see that very often. So when I do see something like that, <clears throat> it's it excites me quite a bit. So I, you know, look for those sorts of things. Right now my my parkour vision is very vertical. Like I tell people like, oh yeah, I'd like I, I do vertical parkour now. <laughs> like <laughs> my training has mostly been horizontal. And then there are days that I would literally say like today's a horizontal day. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, but it's interesting because sometimes I'll go to spots that are great for horizontal parkour, but I just see no opportunities anymore because my brain is almost wired itself to see lines vertically. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other day I was in San Diego, we're at this, you know, great spot, but like there are no ascents or descents. So I kind of just sat there like, I don't know whether this spot's good or not. <laughs> and then <clears throat> once I like got myself to move around, like, oh, I found this like great line. And at the end of that session, I was like, you know what? This is a good spot. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> it was to begin with. I just for sure like the vision to, to see, but. Well, where do you see yourself in, in five years? You know, you're an athlete that the word that came to mind was, oh, he's reinvented himself. That's what it feels like from the outside. 
And some of that's, of course, because you went from from the Matthew Jang that Etre Four in Hong Kong to this barefoot version of you, and with long hair as well. So it's like you've changed your image from an outside perspective. Maybe you don't feel this way, but it feels like, oh, this is a different Matthew. Yeah. With that in mind, with that journey in mind, well, and you can respond to that for sure. Also, where do you see yourself in the future, five years or 10 years down the line? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people ask me like, oh, is, is what you're doing like a persona or like something that you're tr trying to become? And my answer is always like, of course not. Like, hmm. I, I think that's dumb. Um, I think um, at least as far as who I am, I've always been very adaptable. I've always like, have been able to express myself in many different mediums, very di different <clears throat> activities. And what I'm onto now is just like, what you see is it's all me. It's just being expressed through a more specific, in a more specific way. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's like uh, a side of me that is was always there but it's just allowing itself to be expressed more so um and I th it, for me it's been uh it's been a beautiful journey because um I, I grew up in hong kong and i always like was very drawn to nature from a from a young child ch climbing trees doing all these things <clears throat> and expressing to my peers like oh you know let's do a hike let's let's go climb this or that. And I'm like, no, that sounds boring or lame or whatever. And so I wasn't, I feel like I wasn't truly fully able to express that part of me until I moved to Hawaii. And then it was the complete opposite, you know, mm. less city, more nature. And so <clears throat> when I first went to Hawaii, all the friends I made, you know, we were running around <clears throat> the woods, shirtless, barefoot, just our shorts, just the way you see me. And um, just so when you see me on Instagram and, um, that was just always, that was always there. It just wasn't, I just wasn't like showing that in any form until now. And so, <clears throat> um, it's in, it's, it's cool to have kind of like the two kind of, um, <clears throat> parts of my life, like growing up in the city and then living in Hawaii kind of come together. I feel like this is the perfect balance of that. Like, you know, you see someone moving in a very primal way, but in an urban environment. So like, it's mm -hmm. the balance of like the part of island life <clears throat> that I've lived and also city life, Hong Kong coming together, merging and becoming, um, just one thing. And like, yeah, I won't get into that, but yeah. Well, no, I'll tell you that that's what I see in your videos is first of all, they seem very authentic. So the question is, is a persona never occurred to me because it, this is, this is you. It, there doesn't seem to be any, anything that you're, that you're putting on. It seems like something about it seems extremely congruent into like your nature, your spirit. And then also there is clearly this melding of what feels like a natural presence and then the city presence as well. Now, some of my favorite videos are ones where you're in nature because I think those are really cool. But mm -hmm. having both, having the concrete with you being barefoot and working with trees, as I've seen in some of your recent videos or climbing roots and things like that, it what you are perceiving, I'll tell you this, at least from my perspective, I see all of that and it's very cool and also very original. Maybe that speaks to your authenticity and the congruency, but it seems very original and very cool. And I think that's why your videos blew up and I think that's why you'll continue to grow. And I, I fully expect you to get the half a million or a million views, a million followers on Instagram the next year or so, just because what you're doing is, is something unique and something cool. And it's clearly resonating with people. And I think that the authenticity and congruency is a strong reason why. Yeah. No, yeah. I appreciate that. I, I think it's, I think thinking back, um, in, in many ways, like what you see on Instagram right now is more unique and more unique and a closer expression to who I am <clears throat> than before because 
when I first started parkour, you know, I was only watching videos of urban free flow and, you know, mm -hmm. these guys in Europe. And I was like, I just want to be like them. I just want to wear like baggy pants. I just want to eventually be sponsored by Etrefor. I want to move that way. And even though I eventually moved to Hawaii and was, you know, running through the mountains, barefoot shirtless, all these different things, like that didn't really get a chance to express itself until now. And so, um, yeah, now it's like, it, it's almost funny. Like once I decided to like show a side of my training that I was doing, just not highlighting now, like people are like, oh, wow. Like, and it's so cool. <laughs> it's cool. Like it's cool. I like it. Um, but yeah, it's just funny. It's this journey you talked about. You talked about it with your faith as well, where you grow up and you have to decide, is this what I believe? And I feel like we're all on that journey where it's, who am I? And as you, when you grow up, you have your parents, you have your friends, you have your influences. And then as you get older, hopefully a lot of people, but not everybody, sort through that and figure out who am I? Like, what's my authentic self? And it sounds like you found that. And so the first vision of Paul Crow was urban free flow in Europe and concrete, but you had this pulling and now you've been able to like integrate the true version of yourself and express the true version of yourself. Yeah, for sure. Very cool. Matthew, is there anything you want to talk about? Anything you want to highlight? Are there projects you're working on? Uh, initiatives you want to bring attention to? Are there ideas you want to share? Is there anything else you want to, to talk about before we end this? Uh not specifically nothing that comes to mind I, I mean i can talk for days but i mean i think it's just important that you know whoever's listening or whatever you know just find your maybe it sounds cliche but find your way like find your way use parkour in a way that is going to amplify everything else you do in life um and it's funny because you know, Daniel Lobaka said this, and he's like, choose not to follow video. It's nothing and it's everything. And I, as I've trained for longer, it that quote has resonated and made more sense to me because I want to say, don't let parkour become everything. Don't. And I think what I mean by that is don't let just specifically the movement of parkour become everything. Allow the, the message behind it to be, if you want, obviously, to become everything because parkour can be used as an incredibly powerful tool to amplify everything else that you do in life it is a it's a it's a problem solving parkour is problem solving basically equation it's like oh <clears throat> there are things that i face in life and instead of giving up when i face an obstacle that i think i can't overcome let me create a solution to overcome that obstacle <clears throat> And, you know, I feel like this is repeated time and time again throughout the history of parkour, but like, I can't, you know, overstate it enough. It's like truly allow that mindset to become something that you can use to help you in, in other stages of your life, um, to become better. Yeah. Was the quote the choose not to fall quote, was that the one that you said? I didn't quite understand. It, it's from that video, but uh, um, okay. It, the first thing that Danny says is it's nothing and it's everything. And we don't really know what question was asked in him for him to come up with that response. But I believe the question is, what is parkour to you? And his response is, it's nothing and it's everything. That's very cool. That's a great way to end it. And I think that's a really inspiring idea to think about. So parkour or life doesn't, isn't limited to parkour. And the mm -hmm. lessons that we learn from parkour and the adventure we take and the journey doesn't end when we stop jumping. And if we're old and one day we can't jump, all those lessons are still the part of us. And so I think you talked about it too, when you talked about mental health and some people come out of that when they find parkour. But if they lose it, then sometimes they go back into the spiral. And you see that if sometimes if an athlete gets injured, so all of a sudden they go into de a depression of some type. 
if parkour is your everything, then that's a slippery slope. But if it's nothing, then you're probably not doing anything. But maybe if it's nothing and everything at the same time, then you find a balance between what it yep. can be and what it is. Mm -hmm. Precisely. I love it. Matthew, it's been a joy to talk to you. And uh, I would, oh, well, are you ever going to coach one day? Because when I see someone like you, I'm like, man, that's someone that I would want. <sighs> like, there's not a lot of people that I'd want to learn from, but something that I would be inspired enough to be like, what can I learn from this guy? Will you ever coach one day? Yeah, so I, I get asked this again quite a bit, but you know, people ask me to teach them and coach them. But then I look at their profile and they're like, "Oh, you're in India. Like, how am I going to do that?" <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> online, online classes, I guess. Yeah. Um, I I've been coaching for quite a while. Actually, that's something I you know don't bring up a lot, but I have been how long have I been coaching? I maybe half, probably more than half of my entire park career. I mean, like, really? at least 10 years. I feel like, Christmas? no, to varying degrees, like, um, you know, helping out with classes. And I was, my first job was working at a gymnastics gym. So starting with that and then eventually kind of teaching a parkour curriculum, um, I've taken uh, private students, uh, private lessons. No, I haven't taken private lessons. I've given private lessons to students. And I think that's, if I am to coach like in person, um, that is my preferred uh, method of training, just one-on-one, -on -one, but, mm -hmm. but small groups. Um, I, <clears throat> yeah, I guess we, one of my goals I didn't mention was, uh, Kind of, I, I have yet to think about this more, but my goal is to maybe in the next year or two come up with a just just a a park learn parkour seven day course, but of course barefoot. Um, Whoa, teaching people to be able to do it barefoot because I I think at at this point in my training I would I would love to see like. <clears throat> parkour taught to children barefoot and then i think that's just like a natural progression like children are already doing par like parkour barefoot but to be able to teach them skills that are gonna make them more efficient i think that would be really great and then putting shoes on would be like the natural progression like oh, okay you've learned all these movements barefoot like Oh, try put these shoes on and see what you can do because you're going to be able to do like a whole lot more not having to worry about your feet. So <clears throat> I would love to, yeah, I would love to see people start doing parkour barefoot. And now when I do teach, I do teach parkour barefoot. I like, okay, we're going to start training barefoot. That way you get, you know, you get the feeling of the ground beneath you. You're getting all this sensory information. And <laughs> one of the best, one of my favorite quotes that I've been telling people all the time, there's no better teacher than the concrete because the concrete will tell you everything you need to know about whether or not you're landing correctly or incorrectly. And, um, another, I don't know who, but like this, a barefoot marathonist you know, says like the pain you experience is more than pain. It is information that your body is gathering about the world around you. There is good pain and bad pain. When you train barefoot, people ask me, do you feel pain? I'm like, of course I feel pain. No, to varying degrees, you will naturally feel pain, but that is that there's good pain and bad pain. Mm -hmm. You step on a rock. Yeah, you feel the pain of the rock under your foot, but is that bad pain? No, it's just like, oh, I stepped on a rock. That's, that's really it. So being able to, um, yeah, just train with that mindset that this is like almost like the sixth sense that we are using in parkour. When you have your shoes on, you're missing a lot of feedback and information. So being able to train someone barefoot first and then, okay, you're able to do that. Let's put shoes on see what you can do. <clears throat> Man. 
I love it. That'd be the way to go. I totally can see the vision and I can see how valuable that would be, especially to kids who don't know any better. Maybe for an old guy like me, maybe it'd be tough to transition, but it's still, you still inspire me to want to try it. So mm -hmm. we'll see what I can do. Yeah. I bet you inspire a lot of people. So yeah. Matthew, thank you for the time today. You've been great. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was good, good time. Go to eat some lunch. <laughs>